Good morning, God's beloved. Welcome to Worship with University Christian Church. Ooh. I'm Reverend Megan Peckler, the senior minister here, and I'm so happy to be here with all of you today, whether you are worshiping with us in person or online. If you would please take a moment to register your attendance with us, uh, especially if you are a first-time visitor. We would appreciate that because we'd love to be able to be in touch and answer any questions you may have about the life of the church. You can sign in by scanning the QR code on the back of your bulletin, or in most of the pews, there are um, little sign-in cards that you can leave in the offering plates a little bit later on in the service. If you find yourself in need of a restroom at any point, you can go through this side door over here, and there are going to be some signs pointing you on your way. Lots of announcements today. It's a big week in the life of the church, as you all know. Um, first, I want to thank everyone who attended or helped with yesterday's community celebration for the unveiling of our new um, art installation out in the courtyard. And Billy Joe Miller, the artist, is here with us today. Again, we are so glad and grateful for his work. Uh, immediately following the service today, we are going to have a dedication and blessing of that piece. So at the end of the service, after the postlude, I will lead a procession, and I think we should all wave our palms as we are processing out of the sanctuary, out into the courtyard where we will gather to dedicate that piece of art. Today uh, marks the beginning of Holy Week with Palm Sunday, and so we enter into Holy Week with a mixture of jubilance and also trepidation as we walk with Jesus through this week. There are a variety of opportunities this week to um, walk through those events. And so you'll notice on the back of your bulletin, there's a Maundy Thursday service on Thursday. At seven o'clock, it will be here in the sanctuary. And then on Good Friday, we're going to have a prayer service on Zoom. If you need the link to that, please let me know. And then on Easter Sunday, just a week from today, we will have a potluck brunch at 9.30 in the Fellowship Hall, an Easter egg hunt following the brunch. Side note, if you would like to bring filled Easter eggs to help make that a very wonderful Easter egg hunt for our little ones, please do so. You can still bring them next week. If you have them with you today, there is a table out in the narthex where you can leave them. And then we will have worship. Uh, also remember to bring your cut flowers. We're going to add them to the flowering cross, which will be out in the courtyard. Um, and it will be a beautiful um, visual representation of the new life um, of the resurrection. We are collecting donations for Micah 6 in lieu of Lily purchases. Um, these are due today. If you still haven't gotten yours in, you can make them in honor or in memory of um, any loved one or organization or what have you. Um, you can leave this along with the payment or you can do that online in the um, offering plates today. Now, um, unrelated to Holy Week, but relevant to the life of the church, I'd like to share with you uh, an update about our parking lot situation. Most of you will remember in 2021, we sold our parking lot to UT. They're going to build a new academic building on that site and where Dobie Garage currently is. And we are excited for that project to begin. We are excited for generations of UT students to be blessed through the opportunities and the growing and the learning that will happen in that new space. This week we did receive final confirmation that the last day we will have access to the parking lot is April 14th. So that time is coming up. We are in regular communication with UT. They are committed to being good neighbors and good partners through this process. And so uh, we will send out an email with a lot more information um, very soon. So stay tuned for more details about um, everything. And if you have any questions, please ask me or Cody Somerville or Keith Smith, and we will do our best to get you answers. And now, dear ones, as we enter into Holy Week, 
May the Spirit of God be with each of us as we go from the triumphant entry to the Last Supper, to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, and finally, to the empty tomb. Peace to you all, and welcome to this time of worship. Our call to worship this morning is responsive. So a call and response after me. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. 
Please rise as in body or in spirit as we sing together our opening hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Wave those palm branches. Would you join me in the responsive litany of praise? Blessed is the coming kingdom. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Our prayer list is on the back of the bulletin, so if you will take a look at that, I'd like to make a couple of updates and corrections. First, uh, correction, um, Addie Lou, Jimmy's sister, um, died on Friday. Um, there's a typo here in the bulletin, so we hold you and your family in prayer, Jimmy and Sue, um, as you grieve Addie Lou. We also lift up in prayer all of those who were injured and the loved ones of those who died in the bus accident on Friday. Um, most of you have probably heard about that. It was a bus of preschoolers primarily, um, and two individuals, including one preschool boy, 
um, died in that accident. And so we hold them close in our hearts. We give thanks for Rudy, who is uh, recovering from surgery and here today, and it is so glad, we are so glad to be with you and that you're doing so well. Um, I'd also like to share a quick update about my husband, Steve, who is recovering from a liver transplant almost five weeks ago. Um, we had his weekly update, uh, weekly follow-up appointment on Thursday in San Antonio, and he has the lowest liver enzyme levels he's had in about 20 years. So uh, that new liver is working very well, and we are so grateful for that and for all of your support along the way. Our prayer is a responsive one, and so when you hear me say, O oh God, in your mercy, you're invited to respond by saying, hear our prayer. So I will say, O oh God, in your mercy, and you will say, hear our prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Triumphant God, you come to us as one who seeks and serves. We give you thanks for your saving love made known to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Day by day, you awaken us to the truth that there is no place you have not been and no place you fear to go. We confess that we have sinned, and although we would like to deny it, we have forsaken you. Open the gates of your forgiveness and restore us in your love. To you, O God, we pray for the cares of the world, especially lifting up loved ones of Adi Lu, all of those who were injured, and the loved ones who, whose loved ones died in the bus accident on Friday. We also lift up to you Jefferson as he heals from surgery. And now in the silence, we lift up to you all of those other names that are written on our hearts. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, your Son humbled himself even to death to show us the power of loving service. Guide those who are holding positions of power that their decisions give rise to the mutual flourishing of the world that you so love. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing God, your son is betrayed and crucified in our violent world each day. Raise us to a new and rightly ordered world through the reconciling love of Christ. We're all victims of violence, persecution, shame, or terror. May stand together with you in peace. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Forsaken God, as your son suffered his cruel death on the cross, darkness covered the whole land. Enlighten us to care for your creation. Awaken us from our denial and abuse and help us to alleviate its suffering. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grieving God, your son consoled others in life and in death. We pray together for all who are distressed, broken, or sorrowful, that with Christ and his suffering, we may be healed and raised in you. O oh God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, lead us through the events of this holy week, that we may receive Christ afresh in our lives and embody Christ's spirit into the world. Help us to be faithful witnesses to your coming reign of justice, mercy, and peace. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. I'm reading verses 12 through 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Here ends the reading. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, pour out your spirit on us that we hear the word you have for us this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here we are, Palm Sunday. This Lenten season, we've been walking along with Peter, focusing on his life and faith. And also accompanying us through this journey is the hymn, Come Thou Fount. And so you'll notice that today's sermon title um, pulls from the lyric, Songs of Loudest Praises. Music helps us to come into closer contact with the holy, and I think we all um, witness that today, week in and week out. I am grateful for our excellent choir and the excellent direction they receive from Morgan Kramer, but especially today. So thank you, choir. Um, what a powerful, moving, uh, offer, or special anthem. So, so far this Lent, we've been with Peter as he witnessed the abundant catch of fish and was told to drop everything and to follow Jesus. We've been with him as he walked on water and called to Jesus for rescue, as he proclaimed faith and couldn't bear to hear Jesus foretelling of his death, so Jesus told him to get behind him, get out of his way. And we've been with Peter as he's asked questions and learned about how deep and wide God's grace is and how repetitive forgiveness can be. And so it's odd then that the uh, folks who put together this sermon series had us today look at a piece of scripture that doesn't mention Peter at all. He is with the other disciples. He sort of blends in with them as they fade into the crowd. And that crowd is in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. The population grew from about 50,000 people to 200,000 people. It was a big event, so big that the Roman governor was there too, mostly to remind the Jewish people who was really in charge. By his presence, he was reminding them that it was okay for them to remember an ancient victory against Egypt, but don't think about trying to resist in the present day. Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan tell about how this parade by Jesus through the streets on a young donkey was an act of political theater. He was mocking Rome's pomp and circumstance. They describe the Roman imperial power and their procession into Jerusalem this way. It was a cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles mounted on poles, sun glinting on metal and gold. Can you see it? Are you starting to feel like you were there? Imagine the sounds of marching feet, creaking of leather, the clinking of bridles, the beating of drums, the swirling of dust, the eyes of the silent onlookers, some curious, some awed, some resentful. 
And so that was on one side of the city. And then on the other side of the city comes Jesus and his procession. He came riding in on the back of a donkey and it was ridiculous looking. Borg and Crossan write, what we often call the triumphal entry was actually an anti-imperial one, a deliberate lampoon of the conquering emperor entering a city on horseback through gates opened in abject submission. So we have some polar opposite parades going on on this Palm Sunday. Jesus' entry, unlike Rome's, was nonviolent, vulnerable, mostly unimpressive. John's version that we heard today of this story, this not-so-triumphal entry, it's the shortest telling. The other Gospels don't mention how the disciples didn't understand. But that's a theme in the Gospel of John. Over and over, he is drilling into us how incomprehensible, how ungraspable the story of God dwelling among us is. The disciples didn't get it because they hadn't seen the whole story. We don't get it, even though we know what's to come. We can't get it quite yet. Can you imagine what the crowd was expecting that day before they went out and saw Jesus entering in this very humble way on the back of a donkey? They just heard that Jesus was coming. They knew that he was something special. They were ready for a feast for the eyes. They came out with their palm branches, their chants. Hosanna, save us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They were ready for a king who would change everything. And then they saw what one commentator describes as a parade of misfits. Do you think that their high expectations were toppled at that point, or did they start to figure out what kind of king Jesus was? It was meant to be a ridiculous, somewhat silly scene through a sort of joke, through absurdity. Jesus was challenging Rome's rule and making a stark contrast that God's kingdom, that one is a kingdom of peace and justice and freedom. He was showing that the violence and the oppression so inherent to Roman rule was not part of the coming of the kingdom of God. It was a subversive, courageous procession. Word surely got back to Pilate about what was happening on the other side of town. It was also a contagious procession the shouts rippling out. I think it became something more impressive with the palm branches waving. I had the wonderful view of looking out at all of you today, waving your palm branches as we sang our opening hymn. It was a sight to behold. And we can think about that first procession, that Palm Sunday that we are remembering today. And we can think about where was Peter? Where were the other disciples? Where would we have been as that took place? Maybe we were right up front. Maybe you're more of a person to stand at the back and see what's going on. Take it all in. But no matter where Peter was in the crowd, no matter where we would have been in the crowd, I don't think any of us would have fully grasped 
the depth and the meaning of the situation we were witnessing. We can grasp it more than Peter and the other disciples did because we have the benefit of knowing the end of the story. Even as we look forward to the events of this week unfolding, we see all of it happen through a resurrection lens. But the disciples didn't know exactly what would happen. Jesus tells us, not Jesus, John tells us that they later did remember. They remembered what had happened. They started to piece it together. And that's part of our invitation this Palm Sunday as well. To walk through this week, not to skip from the highs of Palm Sunday and go straight to the joy of Easter morning. We are invited to go through this whole week remembering and witnessing anew Jesus' ministry, his death, his resurrection. But just because we know the end of the story doesn't mean that we don't also sometimes get confused. I invite you to look in your pews. There should be a copy of the devotional that we used this Lent. They're going to be on the inside of each pew, so if you're sitting more on that end, the people on the inside will have to pass it out to you. If there isn't one on your row, there should be one on the row in front of or behind you, tucked right in front of the Bible. So once you get that devotional out, I unwisely forgot to bring one up here with me. (laughs) Turn to page 33. Once you've gotten a look at it, pass it on to your neighbor. The artist who created this work, Reverend Liesl Gwyn Garrity, shares in her artist statement on the opposite page that this depicts two different sides of Peter. There's the confusion that he must have felt at the Palm Sunday procession as he reflected on the dissonance of hearing the crowds sing Hosanna for this soon-to-be-killed king. He hadn't yet witnessed Jesus' death, but Jesus had foretold it. Peter knew somewhat what was to come. And he's feeling that confusion and that sense of loss and and not knowing exactly what is going to happen. And then the other depiction of him It's the same one, but a mirror image. And just that simple flip starts to convey not confusion, but awe. His awe at seeing the empty tomb, as Garrity writes, as waves of hope and relief were rushing through him like a river of grace, the remembering happening all at once. Today we sing songs of loudest praise. Maybe with a sense of joy, but also foreboding. And this week we will gather around the Last Supper at the foot of the cross. There will be the quiet waiting of Holy Saturday and finally we will get to the empty tomb. And every step of the way we get to be there remembering, reenacting, letting the meaning of all of it, the peaceable kingdom that protests pain and violence, Jesus' commandment to love one another, the sharing of bread and wine, his horrible death and our grief. And then in just one week from today, we will get to experience the indescribable resurrection joy May all of that sink into us deeper than before.
For those of us who sign up to be worship leaders, Megan provides a few key words to describe the focus of the sermon and the service. And we heard these words in her sermon today, subversive, courageous, contagious praise. I love her use of the word subversive. We might also say riotous or rebellious. Riotous praise takes courage. Rebellious praise is joyful, full-throated, and contagious. I would imagine that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was riotous and subversive, full of singing and dancing and palm-waving and celebration. Of course, we have the benefit of hindsight, and we know that the riotous praise turns dark and distressing before the week is out. But on Palm Sunday, we celebrate with hosannas. Can you remember the last time you raised your voice in a song of loudest praise? For me, it is memories of joyful praise as a member of the choir. But joyful praise doesn't have to be literal. It can be evident in acts of service and giving. Today on Palm Sunday and next Sunday on Easter, we are collecting an Easter offering to support the ministries of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Giving generously above and beyond our regular giving is an act of loudest praise. You may give by using the QR code in the bulletin or by bringing your gifts forward during communion and putting them in the offertory plates. Let us give courageously. Let our gifts be contagious. Let our gifts be an act of loudest hosannas. pray with me? God of great shouts of hope, remember the crowds in Jerusalem who laid their cloaks on the road, shouting Hosanna as Jesus passed. Just as you received their voices of praise upon entry to Jerusalem, 
receive these gifts as an expression of our joy and gratitude. Take our voices and our offerings and use them to proclaim your salvation to all people. In your son's holiest name, amen. The concept of reenactment is not new to us as we reenact the events of this Holy Week. We can remember that every week we reenact the Last Supper when Jesus gathered with his friends in that upper room and told them to remember him through these symbols of bread and cup. Every week, Sunday in and Sunday out, anytime we gather pretty much, we are blessed to remember, to reenact through the resurrection lens, knowing that through this meal, we are fed and strengthened and again come close to the Christ. We remember the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This, this is, is my body, body which, which is, is for you. Do this, this in remembrance of me. In the same way, the cup after supper, saying, This, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. According to his commandment, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. God of grace and God of glory, as we have called out our hosannas, you have heard our cries for help and our shouts of adoration. We will soon recall more solemn and even fearful times. We know that there is even more joyous celebration coming, but let us remember that Jesus' disciples did not yet have that certainty and endured days of anguish. You gave all that we might have life, and we are thankful for the gift of your Son who showed us how to live a life of faith. 
We are grateful for the sacrifice that conquered sin and death and gave us the gift of abiding grace. Help us to always remember that we, as Christ's disciples, are called to be living examples of your love and mercy. Bless now this bread that is broken and wine that is poured as it was so long ago, and yet remains an eternal token and reminder of the life, sacrifice, and death of your Son, Jesus, our Christ. Amen. This table is open to all. Jesus invites each of us to it. And so as you are ready, you're invited to come forward down the center aisle and receive communion from our elders. Each tray has a little cup of bread and a little cup of juice just for you. You're invited to partake of the bread as you receive it. And if you feel comfortable, carry the juice with you back to your seat, as it is a long-standing tradition for us to share in the cup together. If you'd rather take that as you receive it, that is just fine as well. If you need someone to bring you communion, please remain seated, raise your hand, and I will bring it to you. The feast is ready. Let us partake in it.
the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of new life. If you'd like to learn more about uh, what's going on in the life of the church or how you can get more involved, or if you'd like to talk about what membership means, I invite you to reach out to me anytime. And if you'd like to join in membership this day, I invite you to come forward as we sing together our closing hymn. to remain seated during the postlude and then we will process together out into the courtyard where we will dedicate to Sunray Cat by Billy Joe Miller. And following that, there will be a cookie reception in the fellowship hall. These are homemade cookies by our excellent bakers in the church. You will not want to miss that cookie reception. And um, before Kathy starts the postlude, I'd like to also, um, thank her and Sabrina for all of their musicality and gifts that they share um, along with Morgan and the choir. Uh, this week is a big one for all of our musicians, and they are blessing us with all of their extra hard work. Um, so thank you, all of you. Receive now this benediction. Beloved, as you go from here, may you rejoice in the immeasurable love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus. Go in God's goodness, grace, and peace to love and serve. Amen.
Let's go. 